You lit up the northeast coast of this little island with your resplendent African sparkle, a smile that seemed to make your sprint just that little bit more incredible. My name is Johnny Pitts. I'm a television presenter, photographer and performance poet. I'm on a journey to find out about the world's first black professional footballer, Arthur Wharton. I'm in the northwest Manchester to visit an Arthur Wharton expert, Louis Athen. We had to do a project on a famous Victorian, and um, well, I wanted to do um, a black person and maybe a black footballer. And then um, uh, we were just searching, and then we found Arthur Wharton. Well, listen, I'm a bit of an Arthur Wharton novice, so that's why I've come to you. So I'd like you to tell me a little bit about this man. So, so where does it all start then? Well, it started when he came over to the UK from Ghana and um, his PE teacher um, noticed that he was like a real, really fast runner. So he put him in for the AAA race at Stamford Bridge and he won it. When he first came home, I said to him, just kind of think a little bit now? more outside of the box because I knew everybody at school was doing kind of Charles Dickens or the kind of usual Victorians. And I think he, he kind of put a lot of energy into it. I used to think of like black British heritage as, you know, the wind rush and, you know, the first wave of immigrants coming through with like the late forties. But to know that, that there was a black Victorian, that's quite an amazing thing. So when you first look it up on the internet, it's very, very hard to find anybody who's black who's a Victorian. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so he really put a lot of effort into that to find somebody. But also because of his roots, because he is mixed race. So I think maybe now, after this, he will kind of question it a bit more, maybe look into himself and ask more questions about where he's from. I'm following Louis Leeds to find out a bit more about what Arthur achieved. I'm visiting a place where in 1886, Arthur Wharton made his greatest sporting achievements and set an astonishing world record. This is Stamford Bridge Stadium, home of Chelsea Football Club. I'm here to meet football historian Phil Vasile, who's going to tell me a bit more about Arthur's record-breaking achievement. stadium that Arthur Warren's connected with. Before Chelsea were a football club, before they came to play at Stamford Bridge, it was an athletic stadium. So this has been a kind of sporting ground for um, well over 130 years. What really was the equivalent of the World Championships, the Amateur Athletics Association Championships, wow. uh, he won the sprint two years in succession here at Stamford Bridge in 1886. And then in 1887 in Stourbridge, where the championships was then, and in 1888 he turned professional in running and he won the World Professional Championships, which was the September Handicap in Sheffield in 1888. His record of 10 seconds was uh, later ratified by the uh, 3A's Amateur Athletics Association. Uh, as a record and that began the world record list really. His time uh, of 10 seconds was really the, the first acknowledgement of a world record. He was sort of the Victorian Usain Bolt. <laughs> yeah he was. There was a lot um, written about it at the time because 
he was the first, obviously, mixed heritage uh, yeah. uh, sprint champion, and also he was the first um, northerner to hold that, which didn't go down well in London, you know. <laughs> What we're going to do now is try to delve into Arthur Wharton's world and see what it would have been like to race under 1880s rules. Arthur would have raced with a handicap, which means that he would have started a little bit behind some of the other racers, so that's what we're going to do right now. Let me join the lads and uh, get warmed up. The handicap system was used to slow down faster runners like Arthur and give people who betted on the racers better odds. These races made tidy profits for the race organisers and for the amateur runners, giving rise to the term sham amateurism. But this handicap system frustrated Arthur and during one race he started so far back that he couldn't make up the distance and came in second. On the winner's podium he grabbed the glass ball trophy he'd just won and dashed it to the floor, smashing it to pieces. According to eyewitness reports, Arthur's running style was unique for a sprinter. He ran with his legs raised high and leaned back with a long-legged stride. He was often one of the last runners out of the starting blocks. But during the middle of the race, Arthur would catch up, much to the consternation of his rivals. At the time of his record-breaking three years championship win, Arthur was running for the Birchfield Harriers, an athletics club based in Birmingham. Arthur did run a few races for um, Birchfield Harriers. He was not a member of the, of the club, but however, he helped them in fundraising um, races. So I think it was over a two week or so period where he, he run a series of races um, to raise funds really uh, and to try and get Birchfield Harriers out of a bad financial situation. Whatever sport Arthur did, it seems he was never far away from football. In Arthur's day, the Birchfield Harriers trained at Aston Hall Lower Ground now the site of Aston Villa Football Club. A man called Tom Bott, a racing promoter and member of Sheffield United's board, had a stable of runners, including some black runners who would sometimes train with Arthur. At the same time that Arthur was running and winning, he was also playing football and making his mark at a professional level. Howard from Football Unites Races and Divides is at the Old Feetums Football Stadium to find out more about Arthur's time at Darlington Football Club. Can you just tell us a little bit then about Arthur's career, what you know about it in Darlington? He was here from 83 through to 88. He came to Darlington to study as a Methodist preacher in 1883 and uh, at some point during his time at Cleveland College in Darlington, um, Manny Hebron, the then trainer of the cricket and football club saw that Arthur had a turn of speed. Very athletic young man, charismatic, strong, big, quite tall, particularly for the day. Took him under his wing and lo, he turned him into just, just a legend. We hear words from the BNP, the National Front, the Indi English Defence League, all about what immigrants take from our community. I realised very, very quickly, actually Howard, there's very, very little out there that that celebrates what we contribute, in, and that includes a statue. Arthur played for lots of clubs, but it was his time at Preston North End that cemented his name as a star goalkeeper. The Chelsea or Manchester United of their day, previous players for the club include David Beckham. They were known as the Invincibles because they were hardly ever beaten and in the first year of the Football League, the Football League was created in 1888, in that first season they did the double, they won the league and the cup, which meant they went unbeaten in the cup and they're also unbeaten in the league. So here I am at the goal and Arthur Wharton would have been here as one of the best goalkeepers in the country at the time. Um, obviously he'd have had the whole crowd watching him and you just kind of wonder back then what they would have made of this goalkeeper who was, who was amazingly skilled and very fast off the mark as well but black, 
he was often criticised for being a bit of a, uh, the word skylark was used, a bit of a kind of clown in goal. Because, for instance, he'd crouch in the corner of the goal and, uh, and lean against the post and then jump out just as a save had to be made. A lot of people thought that was showman, should be showing off, you know, this crazy African. He could legitimately, with, with or without the ball, be knocked over, shouldered over. Uh, which would leave an empty net for the team to shoot into. So if he was crouching in the corner of the goal, leaning against the post, it's a small target, he couldn't be knocked over. The reason for hanging on to the crossbar was, A, you pulled the crossbar down so the ball went over the top, and B, if you caught it between your legs and you were hanging on to the crossbar, you couldn't be knocked into the net. Arthur was known as the keeper with the prodigious punch. At that time, because of the different rules in football, if a goalkeeper caught the ball, he became an object, uh, you know, that could be attacked. So most goalkeepers uh, in the 1880s and 1890s, even in early 1900s, rather than catch a ball, they would punch it away because they want to get the ball away from them as quick as possible. Arthur was unique in lots of ways. In this photo, he wears long leather welder's gloves to protect his forearms when down on the ground. This was an innovation that no other goalkeeper at the time considered. I'm here at Bramall Lane to meet a football historian, John Garrett. What do we know about Arthur Wharton? Wharton was a, a fascinating character at the time he came to Sheffield United as a goalkeeper. Uh, Wharton was really coming to understudy one of the great figures in Sheffield United history, which was our goalkeeper, the, uh, the phenomenal legendary William Henry Foulkes, who was still the biggest, heaviest international football player ever. Riding tricycles became a craze in the late part of the 19th century, and as a keen athlete, Arthur wasn't immune to the bug. In 1887, a 22-year-old Arthur became a tricycle racing champion by riding the fastest time over the 10-mile distance from Blackburn to Preston. Besides running, cycling and football, Arthur was also known for his prowess as a batsman. This is where Rotherham Town Football Club used to play and it's where the Rotherham Town Cricket Club uh, currently play and have played for about 140 years. This was where Arthur obviously began as a professional footballer with Rotherham Town and it's also where Arthur played in his later years for Rotherham Town Cricket Club. He was seen as, as somewhat of an entertainer and a character as well as a member of the Rotherham Town Cricket Club. One of Arthur's most famous innings came in August of uh, 1907 uh, playing against Denneby in a league match, he hit two ginormous sixes, one of which went clean out of this ground onto Broome Road, which is behind the current pavilion. That hit was one of the biggest ever seen on this ground, and it equalled a hit made by uh, the famous Nottinghamshire batsman who played here, called William Gunn, in an earlier match. So Arthur can say that he actually matched the achievements of a Nottinghamshire and England test batsman. I've lived in Sheffield most of my life and I never really knew that this was here. This is a cholera monument built in 1832 and it's a listed building. It seems to me that Sheffield and the North are full of these sort of these hidden secrets that no one really knows about and I feel like Arthur Wharton was a bit of a hidden secret. Just who was Arthur Wharton and what made him so special? Arthur Wharton was born in Jamestown in a suburb of Accra, the capital of Ghana, in 1865. Born into the wealthy Grant family, his mother was descended from Ghanaian royalty. Arthur Wharton's parents were Henry, uh, Reverend Henry Wharton and Annie Florence Grant. Annie Florence Grant was half Scottish, half Ghanaian. Um, Annie Florence's parents were John Chapman Grant who was a Scottish merchant 
and a lady called Ama Idreba, who is from the Kumfi area or the Kumfi district as it's called now in the central region of Ghana. I was fortunate actually because um, my dad knew the two grand sisters and, um, and he quickly sort of got me in touch with them and I went to see them um, at their house in Kaneshi um, and they had photos and, um, and, and, and a few stories and a few letters actually. Manny has met relatives of Arthur Wharton, two sisters called Wilhelmina and Elizabeth Grant. Had they heard of Arthur Wharton? They, they had, they were fortunate enough. Um, Arthur Wharton is, is not a, a well-known name, um, never mind in England, in Ghana either. So, but they had, they were fortunate enough, obviously through the work that their dad was doing for Ray. Um, of course, so yeah, so right. they had heard of Arthur, yeah. um, but they were it, just as excited as I was. It was the original research of writer and historian Ray Jenkins that started the rediscovery of Arthur's life. I understand you found out a really interesting link, a footballing link to Arthur as well as part of your research. Can you tell us what it is? Through my research I got to find out about Kim Grant who um, played in England for Charlton, played for a few other clubs. He's currently a European scout for West Bromwich Albion, so okay. still very much involved. Quite in, recent then? Yes, he's still very much um, involved in, in football. I'm here to visit one of the last living relatives of Arthur Wharton. I wonder what she'll think of me, a TV presenter and ex-footballer, looking for Arthur after all these years. So Sheila, how did it feel when this lightning bolt struck and suddenly you thought, I actually might be part Ghanaian? <laughs> well, I, I never thought of it that way. I just thought, well, this would be amazing if, 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 this, if this man who'd accomplished so much was, had had an affair with my grandmother and, and I, I was his, his granddaughter. There must have been some sort of secrecy with my mum that she would never talk about things. And clearly Arthur was definitely involved in your family because you've got all these amazing yeah. photographs here that you found that yeah. you know kind of hidden away. Like yeah. you said, can we have a look at some of them? Arthur married Emma Lister in 1890, but the marriage produced no children. But suspicions were aroused when Emma's sister Martha gave birth to her first child she was named Minnie Wharton. And later, when Martha gave birth to Nora Proctor, Sheila's mother, the family suspected that Arthur was that child's father too. So Sheila, having found this amazing history, um, have there been any sort of benefits of your newfound fame? There have. There's, um, uh, going down to Wembley was uh, a, a moving, it was a moving experience going down there and meeting some of the uh, uh, hierarchy of the FA. Sheila, how does it feel to be at Wembley and with the Arthur Wharton statue? It feels absolutely marvellous. And I hope my family will carry on with this after me. This is Sheila's grandson, Liam, who seems to be carrying on the family tradition. He's an amateur athlete and footballer in his own right. I, personally, See a bit of Arthur Wharton there. Going into schools and being able to tell this story to children because I was a teacher myself and uh, being able to talk to the children and, uh, and encouraging them because there's been some marvellous work done in schools that uh, I feel a part of and I feel so proud that Arthur's name is being revered and remembered. I have to say I feel a connection to Arthur. We've got a lot of similarities. I played in goal for Sheffield United as a youngster as well. And Arthur Wharton was of mixed race heritage, like me. I wonder what it felt like caught between these two worlds and despite this achieving so much. I can just imagine him running around Sheffield like he's hardly touching the ground, flying through the air as he punches balls out of the goal at Sheffield United. Too fast for his heart, too fast for ignorance, too fast for his enemies, too fast for his brilliance, but too fast for our memories.
I'm here outside Bramall Lane, Sheffield United's ground, and that there is Joe Shaw, one of the club's greatest football players, immortalised as a statue. But what I want to know is why isn't there a statue of Britain's first black footballer? Why don't we remember Arthur Wharton? Steely gaze of Queen Victoria looking down on me in Sheffield's Encliffe Park. Now, in her day, they said the sun never set on the British Empire, and the upper echelons of British society would do almost anything to maintain control. Victorian England's beliefs saw the white man at the top and the black guy forever at the bottom. In the late 1800s, the drive to make profit under capitalism led to the so-called scramble for Africa. Backed by the technological advances made during the Industrial Revolution, European powers invaded and claimed whole swathes of the African subcontinent for themselves. Ghana was one such territory taken over by the British in violent wars which saw a white British ruling class establish colonial rule over the majority black population. Now, Arthur was born under this sort of shadow of British colonialism. Slavery may have been abolished a mere 32 years before he was born, but Victorian England, backed by completely unfounded scientific beliefs, still saw being black as being something less than human. Unlike true hair and like true wool, the negro hair is flat. The negro pile will felt like wool, whereas true hair cannot be felted. In the national newspapers, the Arthur's physiology, his physical appearance, was virtually always commented upon. He was, he was called a brunette of pronounced complexion, uh, a West Indian gentleman, uh, 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 an African man of colour. There was, there was always reference to his physical appearance. Darky, walnut coloured gentleman. <laughs> I was in a race, a mixed race, with me seen only as black. White lines separated us. The only way was forward. I always reached the finish line, but history never let me win the race. The pressures of playing football in Victorian England and trying to make a living took their toll on Arthur. In 1902, Arthur kicked his last football and returned to run his pub in Rotherham. There was almost this kind of umbilical link between pubs and sport and in particular footballers. Now Arthur became a publican of three pubs at least that we know of. So Sheila, this is Albert Street. Yes, and that's right. Arthur had a, had a pub here in 1892, I think it was, the Albert Tavern. Yes. Not here anymore, yeah. is it? No, it's, it it's stood where these flats are okay. standing now. You can remember it, can you? Yes, I can. To give Arthur a pub, uh, as an inducement to sign was, was, was not uncommon really. The problem was it was a, a disaster in terms of uh, his fitness and his ability and capabilities. In 1902, Arthur makes his last Football League appearance, though he still plays cricket and has some memorable matches. After this time, we don't know too much about Arthur's life, but we pick up his story again in 1915, where he's working as a miner. I'm visiting the guys from Yorkshire Main Memorial Trust. Even though the mine's now closed, it left its mark on the community. Hopefully, they can tell me a bit about Arthur's time as a miner. These guys are ex-miners, so they definitely know their stuff. Okay, so will you tell us a little bit about what Arthur did as a job? Because I believe he was a, a haulage hand. What was that then? Basically, an haulage hand was the chappies, the miners, who transported the coal from the coal face to the pit bottom. This is Yorkshire main colliery, and it shows you four haulage hands. Yeah. 
noticed no hard helmets at that time so the roadways were low, uh, uneven, and red hot so it was quite a tough task to get it a few miles from the face to the pit top. It sounds like uh, when Arthur died he'd been ill for quite a while but it's a little bit hazy we're not quite sure you know what caused his, his illness but it could quite easily have, have come from such Hard work, I mean, would have contributed to the hard down. I think a good average death rate would have been about 63, 64 for a miner. Wow. Uh, describe what type of guys would be attracted to working in the mine or, or, or would work in the mine. One who desperately needed to earn a living. Really? Yeah. I'm at 54 Staveley Street, the last recorded address of Arthur Wharton. He lived here until his admission into the poorhouse in June 1930. Arthur had a dirty and dangerous job at Yorkshire Main Colliery, which must have contributed to his ill health. But I need to know more. I'm visiting Andrew at Doncaster Archives to find out what the final months of Arthur's life were really like. One of the things about doing uh, this documentary about Arthur Wharton is he almost becomes a sort of myth and you kind of want to know, th did this person really exist and what was he really like and how did he die, where did he die? So we're here in Doncaster and I'm here with Andrew and who's hopefully going to tell us a little bit more about um, the man Arthur Wharton and, and, and how he lived and died. Here we see Arthur Wharton's name. Um, his date of birth is given as the 28th of the 10th, 1966. His date of admission into the institution is the 16th of the 6th, 1930. And here in the final column, we have the name and address of his nearest relative or friend, and it's his wife, Emma, who is also of the same address, 54 Stavely Street, Edlington. Arthur was admitted to the Springwell Lane Workhouse Infirmary. Workhouses for the poor were notorious places of hardship and hospitals weren't the clean and comfortable environments we know today. So this is the uh, register of deaths from the Springwell House um, institution which was formerly the Doncaster Workhouse um, and it records on the 12th of December Arthur Wharton's death at Springwell House, age 63 and the cause of death is epithelioma of the upper lip. What's quite interesting about that is that it's just another name in a book. Yeah. Um, and so from that, you would never guess um, what this man achieved Absolutely. throughout his life. Have you got anything that might be able to show us um, something about his achievements? If we see here, listed in the public notices column, we've got uh, Sportsman's Death. Wow, okay. um, former Preston North End goalkeeper. Uh, so he was obviously um, well renowned in, at least in, in the Edlington area, to, to appear. Somebody will have gone to the trouble of actually recording it, sending it to the newspaper, and he's obviously there got quite a substantial obituary in this newspaper. I've heard so much about Arthur Wharton, but you do wonder sometimes, you know, how legends are made and if there are these myths. But um, to actually see it in the papers of the time that they've noted, um, uh, you know, pretty much the day he died. Um, all his achievements, it's been incredible to get hands on with the history of Arthur Wharton. Thank you. You're very welcome. Much. No problem. The cancer consumed Arthur at an alarming rate, and six months after entering the infirmary, Arthur died on December the 12th, 1930. All right, okay. He was buried by friends in front of a large crowd of mourners but without a permanent headstone on his grave. Who would have thought we're here in the middle of a mining town in Yorkshire, Edlington, and right here is a grave talking about a guy who was born in Jamestown in Accra in Ghana. It says here, the dust of his toil laid traces that will never be covered. I agree. Where his grave sat unknown, now stands his headstone. I can still hear stories of Arthur in his old age, all muscle, looking like a greyhound. They always used to say that he could catch pigeons down at the miners' welfare ground. 
Bradford provided a stone, a headstone for the grave. Recovering this memory of Arthur has been a labour of love. Phil Vassilate, working with Football Unite's Racism Divides, based much of his research on the work of writer and historian Ray Jenkins. If it wasn't for the work of Ray and Phil and organisations like Football Unite's Racism Divides and, of course, Sheila Leeson, the story of Arthur Wharton's life would remain buried in a pauper's grave. My role is to tell the story of Arthur Wharton and we've been doing that through different strands. Through work in schools, using the medium of art, drama and poetry, through producing a documentary and an exhibition and through doing research about his life as well, which will be ongoing and continuing because there's so much to his story that needs to be told. I also inspired them to, to kind of talk about Arthur in a kind of comparative way um, to themselves, working in a school uh, with a bunch of boys that had had some difficulties in, in other classrooms and they soaked up the information. When they came to perform, they really shone um, to the point where they actually want to go in front of 20,000 people to perform their poems. So for me, it's just astonishing what the subject matter can bring out of young people. I'm on my way to see a group of school students who've been learning about Arthur's story in a very unusual way. Not quite sure what to expect. Oi! Now then! So listen up, I'm not telling a lie. Whilst we say it, it makes people cry. Arthur Wharton was the name. But he came and achieved. Beyond what anyone believed. Becoming a minor and a publican too. His final days, poor from public life. He withdrew. So listen up, I'm not telling a lie. Whilst we see it, it makes people cry. Live, Live a better life like Arthur. Arthur. He's no different because his skin is darker. What I want to know, guys, I guess, is uh, what does Arthur Wharton mean to you? He's an inspiration to all of us as his story battling through uh, racism and... He went like, through a tough life. Yeah, went yeah. through a tough life. He's quite a role model as well. Yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah. Being through, for people going through the yeah. same thing. And he didn't give up either, so it's quite a powerful role model. Uh, just for me, because I thought that was a wicked poem, can I? Can we just do the Arthur one is, was the name bit? And can I be a part of that right now? Yeah. 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 Okay. One, two, three, four. Arthur Wharton was the name! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur's finally got into like a football museum and um, well he's got a huge poster and it's just real good. Yeah. Yeah. You were Yorkshire's King Arthur, sent from Ghana. An absence of memories where they airbrushed you from history but they can never steal from reality that you lived the beautiful game.